there and welcome back to another video. In today's video, I've got something that's going to be a little bit awkward to film, but that I think is going to be really interesting to mess with. Let me just get this thing up onto the desk to see if I can get it in frame first. If you haven't recognized what this is yet, it's an old rack mount server. Specifically, it's a Dell R720. It's pretty darn massive and weighs about 45 pounds, which makes it a little hard to maneuver in a tighter area such as my workbench. Opening it up, let's take a look at what's inside this server. It's got two CPUs, I'm not yet sure which ones they are as the listing that I bought this one from didn't mention the CPUs it came with. In fact, I took a little bit of a risk with this server, as it was listed under the four parts are not working section, and the only real bit of description was that the system wouldn't post because there was no RAM in it. Past that, it was untested, though for the price I paid after shipping, I thought that I might as well give it a go because it'll at least be a fun project. I don't work in IT, and I never have worked in IT. Because of that, I've pretty much never ran into any enterprise hardware, such as rack mount servers like this Dell R720 that I've got. So there's definitely going to be at least a minor learning curve to some of the features on this, but I'm excited to check it out and see what we can do with this thing. The fans in this thing are pretty sweet to start out with. We're gonna have to find out how loud they're going to be when I'm working on this system, as they probably won't be quiet. Another thing that's interesting in this server are all of these placeholder fake dim modules. I'm not 100% sure on the purpose of these, but I believe it's either one of two things, or even both. These modules are maybe in here to just protect the empty dim slots, or maybe also to provide a little more resistance for the airflow in the server. If only a few slots are populated and the rest are blank, a lot of the air from the fans is going to go through the empty space where there isn't any RAM rather than the CPU heat sinks. So putting these faux RAM modules in directs more air over the heat sinks and therefore gets the CPUs cooled better. But that's just my theory. If you know exactly what these are doing in here, let me know in the comments because I wasn't able to find a definitive answer for some reason. Moving towards the back of the main section of the chassis, this system's got a bunch of PCIe cards of some kind in it. So let's take a look at what we've got here. It looks like these cards are some dual port SFP cards of some kind. Two of them were even stuffed with some 8 gigabit per second Finisar transceivers. It turns out that these cards are QLogic QLE 2562 fiber channel cards, which is a standard I've only now learned about. These cards, though looking like network cards, are actually HBAs, or host bus adapters. I've got some more on this in a future video by the way, so stay tuned for that if you're at all interested. Alright, now let's see if we can boot this machine up. As I mentioned before, the eBay listing says that the system didn't come with any RAM, so I went out and bought four 16GB sticks of DDR3 ECC RAM. One benefit I can see to having an older server such as this one is actually that it uses this kind of RAM. It's incredibly abundant on eBay and is also stupidly cheap. I paid about $40 for this 64 gig kit of 1866 MHz DDR3 ECC RAM, and all the sticks were brand new as well. Another thing that I want to take a look at before turning the system on is the set of power supplies that are in here. I received this server with dual 750 watt 80 plus platinum power supplies. These supplies are pretty sweet. They're impressively efficient and output a decently high amount of power. At least in this server's configuration, they're also redundant and hot swappable, which means that if one unit fails, the other will handle the server until someone comes along and removes the dead unit and replaces it. The whole time, the server can stay powered on and working, which is a really neat feature, though it is anything but uncommon in enterprise applications. Also, the childish side of me enjoys the way that they slide in and out of the server. I don't know, I just like plugging them in, almost like SFP connectors. There's something weirdly satisfying about it. I'll quickly run over what's present on the front of the server, though there isn't a ton to talk about here. My server came configured with a set of eight two and a half inch SAS bays. I believe that this system can be configured with another set of these two and a half inch bays, and maybe also some three and a half inch bays. Though I'm not 100% sure if that's available on the R720, but I do know it's available on the R720 XD. With a keyboard, mouse, power, and video hooked up to this system, I hit the power button and it started to power up. It stayed on configuring memory for only a moment, and then switched over to initializing iDRAC, which is Dell's remote management interface. It stayed on this screen for about two minutes, and then it gave up and rebooted. At this point, the server also got a lot angrier than it had previously been, and being in the room with it wasn't the most pleasant thing. It sounded like the fans were pinned to 100%. 
It then went through the exact same memory and iDRAC steps, and iDRAC never confirmed that it configured, and seemingly the server gave up trying again and moved on in its startup sequence this time. I then told it to boot into the BIOS by pressing F2, and after looking around in the BIOS for a bit, the only thing I really discovered was that I was unable to save any changes I made and that the two CPUs we've got are Intel Xeon E5 2650s. Not V2s, not V3s, etc. No, these are the V1s, which just show up as a zero because they're the first ones. These CPUs are of the Sandy Bridge architecture, which you may also know as Intel's second generation core series CPUs, such as the i7-2600. Alright, with my small venture into the system's BIOS completed, I went ahead and let the system go past the BIOS to see what would happen. I was almost certain that there was no storage in the system, but then the server ended up booting into VMware, which is a Type 1 hypervisor. I then went ahead and shut off the server, then plugged a SATA SSD into one of the SAS ports on the front of the server. Usually, SAS controllers should work fine with SATA drives, though not the other way around, meaning that SATA controllers cannot work with SAS drives. I'm going to try to install Windows, not because running Windows on a server is a good idea, or because I want to, but instead because I've got some plans to mess with this server doing non-server things before I make it do real server things with a more sensible OS and setup. Booting into the install media was no issue whatsoever after telling the server to boot into the BIOS boot menu, which then allowed me to select the USB stick instead of whatever was providing the VMware instance. After getting to the drive selection page in the Windows installer, I was unable to find my 128GB SSD, but there were a ton of tiny partitions of something somewhere, which I deemed to likely be the storage medium that the VMware install was on. So clearly a few things are apparent now. There's some kind of an issue with the iDRAC interface that makes it not initialize and therefore cause the server to take several minutes to boot. There's also VMware somewhere in the system. Additionally, there seems to be some issues with the BIOS that is denying me the ability to save any settings I want to change, and finally, the SAS bays up front won't work with my SATA drives as I thought they would. With this known, I went ahead and started pulling parts out of the server to try and find where on earth the VMware install was stored. Is there some kind of EMMC storage on the motherboard? A drive that's just oddly hidden? I'm a newbie when it comes to server hardware, so I have no clue what's happening here, and I want to find out. After pulling out all of the PCIe and riser cards, I found the culprit, the little dual SD module which was populated with two 2GB Kingston SD cards. I plugged these cards into another system and found out that they are in a mirrored configuration, where both of the cards had the same files on them. Well, that's one of our problems figured out, because now we know where the VMware instance was installed. With that done, I went ahead and booted back into the BIOS to see if I could figure out anything that was happening with the iDRAC issue. In the system setup menu, the system was telling me that the iDRAC was not ready because its configuration values could not be accessed. It was also notable that the lifecycle controller was disabled, which, based on the little research that I did, seems to be due to the iDRAC's problems. At this point, it was pretty clear that iDRAC wasn't just being weird, and instead it had a genuine problem with some part of its system. I'm going to have to place another reminder here that this is my first hands-on with a proper server, which in this case really means that this is the first time I've ever seen iDRAC. I may get a few things wrong, but I've tried to research and understand what's happened here as good as I really can. I did some digging online and found that this issue of the iDRAC module malfunctioning and causing exceptionally long boot times as well as other errors on the Dell R720 isn't uncommon. The first few solutions that I found weren't the nicest of solutions, as they all boiled down to the motherboard is cooked. The iDRAC module on the Dell R720's motherboard, or at least the motherboards of these R720's that people are talking about with this issue, have the iDRAC module soldered directly onto them. In some other Dell servers, the iDRAC module can be removed and replaced. However, with this R720, Dell lovingly removed that option, and therefore the iDRAC module is soldered straight onto the motherboard and cannot be replaced. This means that, obviously, I couldn't have tried replacing the iDRAC module, so I had to do a little more digging online, which is when I found some people who claim that these iDRAC issues can be caused by a firmware update gone wrong, and I found a few things to try based on that. A couple of things that people suggested seemed like more simple stuff, such as clearing the NVRAM, which didn't do anything, as well as restarting the iDRAC, which also didn't do anything. It was at this point that I realized that the I button on the back of the server wouldn't light up at all. Under under any circumstance, there was no light emitted from that button and no response from pressing it, so it really wouldn't do anything. Even the I button on the front of the chassis didn't function whatsoever, and also the LCD was entirely off. 
In fact, I thought my server didn't even come with the LCD because it blends into the surrounding black plastic so well when it's not working, but this added even more layers to the issue once I realized that the LCD wasn't working. I also, of course, threw in a couple basic things while I was working on this issue, such as booting up the system with all of the expansion cards removed, as well as trying to clear the CMOS. There's a couple more that haven't been mentioned here, but I'm just trying to hit the more interesting and critical things I tried, so as not to bore you with the simple... I checked the CMOS battery voltage and I unplugged it and plugged it back in again. I also flashed the BIOS on the server to the latest version, by the way, which didn't change the behavior. The most promising thing that I was able to find on this was this article by Dell on how to recover iDRAC with firmimg.d7. The basic procedure for this was to get the iDRAC firmware and then extract the firmimg.d7 file from it, and then you could place that file onto an SD card and insert it into the server. From there, you should be able to fix the iDRAC's firmware However, even after putting it on an SD card that was formatted correctly and everything, I was unable to get it to work. The last thing I was able to find documentation on was the inbuilt UART interface on the iDRAC system. Apparently, you can solder onto this and extract some data and maybe even flash the EMMC storage that stores the iDRAC's firmware, but as I looked into it more, I relatively quickly realized that I likely wouldn't be able to get any results from it. I'm a big advocate for trying something even if you are pretty sure you're going to fail, but but I decided that this wasn't something I was going to try because I couldn't find sufficient documentation. And with what little I had, I realized that I'd have absolutely no clue what was going on at all throughout the process, so it wouldn't have even been a learning experience in the end. It would have been blindly following instructions with no clue what I was actually doing. I did some more digging on this issue that's unimportant really, and almost certainly some that I've forgotten as this video was filmed about a month before writing this script due to other videos taking priority. So it's been a while, but I certainly remember spending upwards of 15 hours researching and trying to fix this issue to no avail. As much as I did not want to replace the motherboard, considering it's 90% functional, I decided that it would be the right option for me. Even though I don't necessarily plan to use iTrack, the issues that it's causing the system aren't issues that I want to be dealing with when making some future videos on this server and then eventually deploying it for some home labbing. So, a while later, the new motherboard that cost me about $70 arrived, and it was time to get it installed. During this motherboard installation was when I really appreciated the modularity of these servers, which I haven't commented on too much yet. Almost the entire process was screwless, removing the fan shroud and fan assembly was incredibly easy, and so was removing the PCIe cards and their risers. The only expansion card that needed a screwdriver was the 4 port 1 gigabit per second Dell networking daughter board, which was also quite easy to take out with just two screws securing it. The power supplies were also easy to pull as they're released through a small lever at the back and then they can just slide out. Cables were nicely labeled most of the time and there weren't any instances of the cables being exceptionally hard to deal with. Removing the RAM was, well, removing RAM. Though I would actually like to point out that this board was in worse shape than I originally thought it was. It obviously had some issues with some of its components, but when I removed a RAM stick, one of the latches on the side of the DIMM just fell off in my hand, and many others were close to detaching as well, which is far less than ideal. Furthermore, although I didn't get a shot of it, when I removed the RAID controller board from the server to set it aside, the new board came with a RAID controller as well, the clips that are used to remove it both fell off as I pressed against them to release it. Maybe getting the new board for the system shouldn't feel as unnecessary as it originally did. After unscrewing the two heat sinks, I revealed the two Xeons that we had in the system, as well as some pretty wet thermal paste. That's not too surprising to me due to how cool these servers are meant to run and the likelihood that this server had its thermal paste replaced at some point in its lifetime. With the CPUs pulled, everything that I needed from the old board had been taken, and I could remove it now. This is the point where I discovered what I think to be the coolest mechanism in this entire server. Man, Having a mechanism like this on desktop computers could be really convenient. Anyway, to get the board out of the server, all you have to do is pull up a little locking pin, slide the board towards the front of the server using the blue handle, and then you can lift it right on out. The only awkward part is getting the board out around the cables and its relatively tight fit with the case. With the new board installed, I removed the paper socket covers I placed on it due to the seller's boldness to ship it without any socket protection, and installed the CPUs. I hooked the cabling back up, applied thermal paste, and screwed down the heat sinks. And past this point, it was really just the disassembly and pretty much perfect reverse order. I put the RAM back in, replaced the networking daughter card, PCI Express risers, 
fans, and lastly the PCIe cards. With the board replaced, I powered up the system and after it displayed initializing iDRAC for a while, I was gifted with the sweet sight of the system completing its initialization. Furthermore, the I buttons and lights were working correctly and the LCD was displaying. The system was also now doing more and more stuff that it never had before, such as some power configurations and a bunch of messages about the system, which I both believe to be caused by the lifecycle controller now functioning. My SATA drive still wouldn't recognize in the front SAS bays, but that just means we'll have to borrow the SATA that's connected to the inbuilt DVD drive when it comes time to mess around on the server by doing things that it wasn't really intended to do. However, that's going to wait until next time, so stay tuned for the other couple videos I plan to do on this server. Today, the only goal was to get it started up and working, which means that this is all I've got for you this time. I hope that you were able to at least enjoy this video and maybe even learn a thing or two. In any case, I hope to see you next time. Goodbye.